right, we're back live on Facebook. Uh, we're Good. traveling back to the Veneto now, uh, near the city of Bassano del Grappa. Uh, for you nice. guessed it, a visit with a historic Grappa producer. Distilleria Poli uh, is a family business uh, with history that dates all the way back to the 1400s in the Veneto. Uh, I love their motto. They say the secret to distilling a great Grappa is simple. You just need fresh must and 100 years of experience. Uh, here to tell you a little bit about Poli's story is marketing and export manager Dario Carlentini. Dario, thank you for being with us today. Thanks to you, Massimo. Thank you very much. Uh, these are uh, tough times, uh, but uh, as you can see, we are smiling. So I, I guess that's the most important. Also, also a big moment for me because this is, I believe, the first time ever in my life that I've been live. So nice. you know, congratulations <laughs> to me, I would say. <laughs> me too. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, but big new experience uh, that I'm sharing with you, Master. So, uh, like we, we were saying a minute ago before going uh, uh, online stream, uh, that I'm going to share my, uh, my screen with you. Fantastic. So we can go through a very, very quick and brief presentation uh, that we have prepared. I have it here. Forgive me, yeah. Um, can you please confirm to me that you see it uh, correctly? Do you see it properly? I don't uh -huh. see it right now. Yep. Hold on just a moment. Of course. Who can show me? maybe yes now. oh yeah yes very, very very good all right so i'm gonna go full screen yeah. that's, it. that's perfect that's it so um the very very quick presentation that we prepared uh, goes uh, through uh the very uh basics of global so geography roots actuality production products and of course affinity what this is obviously a very funny very nice acronym uh, but um, it reflects very well what we what we are and uh, um, where are we placed in the history and development of Grappa. So uh, geography. Well, uh, I guess most people know that uh, uh, Grappa is the Italian spirit. Um, here it says that it's the most renowned, but to be precise, is uh, I would also say the most representative of uh, of uh, Italian spirit blend. And it comes from the, the, the Latin word grappolus, uh, which uh, shortened down in, uh, in ancient Italian and then dialect that became grappa. It comes from the skin of the grape. Uh, we all know that. So it is uh, uh, what uh, is left over after uh, winemaking. So you actually take the grape that is there on the screen, you uh, squeeze it to obtain the juice that will be then fermented uh, and aged and then bottled. And then they, uh, you know, just like after uh, the fermentation, as soon as they take the, the juice out of the mask, they provide us uh, the uh, grape masks that are then distilled there in the ancient alambic that you see just behind me. So that's why we decided to have this uh, <laughs> this uh, camera particularly pointing at this. Um, this is where we are geographically. This is the very northerly part of Italy. Uh, I believe in the uh, bottom right of the screen you can see the Gulf of Venice. Um, this uh, uh, northeastern part of Italy is a very good area for uh, wine making. Uh, I am sure you all know that uh, from this area, Prosecco comes, uh, Amarone comes, and uh, we have a colleague here, Puffy, Puffy behind me. <laughs> um, Amarone, uh, Moscato, Pinot Gris, uh, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Noir, obviously. So it's, it's a region um, from which we can gather a lot of very good grapes. This is an uh, eagle eye view of uh, my town. Um, it's a, a lovely and charming little town uh, that is built upon uh, a river and, uh, and has also uh, a very, very um, deep historical importance because it, was, uh, it played a key role 
during First and during Second World War. Just above my town, you can see the Mount Grappa. So uh, for, for a long time, it was debated whether the word Grappa, the name of the spirit, uh, did it come from uh, Lady Grappolus or did it come from uh, the Mount Grappa? Um, we believe it came from uh, from the Latin word, but uh, you know, <laughs> there has been this debate for a long time. Uh, by many, Bassano is considered the capital of Grappa because the vast majority of the production is around this town. Um, in 1996, um, just just at the side of the bridge that you see in this picture. Um, Jacopo, my boss, which is also the CEO of the distillery, he opened the first Grappa Museum ever. So he was a tribute uh, to uh, Grappa, uh, to everybody who was uh, before us and also contemporary to us, so just to let people know a bit more about this period, about its origins, uh, about our uh, production. Uh, it's a completely free uh, museum. Every year, uh, we gather nearly uh, 200,000 visits to the museum, and they're all for free. Mm, we don't charge anything, and we can also provide free payment if people are interested. Um, outside the town, this is where uh, our distillery is based. It's an uh, um, uh, incredibly small village <laughs> uh, just outside Basan. It's called the Schiavone. The Schiavone. And attached to it, there is a second Grappa Museum because, like I said, we every year we have many, many, many visits, and uh, large groups wanted to gather in the museum. Since the first one is very small, we had the uh, necessity to open a second one, uh, which happened in 2011, in 2011. Uh, so this, is, this one is much bigger because it's not in the city center. Um, this uh, is a very long term history. I, uh, I try to uh, make it straight. Give me a sec. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, it, uh, we don't need to go through every single generation <laughs> for your release. Um, I just, uh, just wanted to know how deep, how deeply the roots of the Polly family um, go uh, in, the, in the local history. So it's uh, 600 years of local history. That's it, that's it. We don't need to, <laughs> to discuss anymore. Um, in uh, in uh, the 1898, uh, the great-grandfather of, of Jacob, of my boss, decided to begin distilling grappa. So this is a picture of the first generation of grappa. As you can see from the very, very serious faces uh, and <laughs> from, the, uh, from the clothing, they had humble origins. They were farmers uh, and they were producing uh, milk and cheese and they also had a very, very uh, small osteria uh, which was uh, uh, giving uh, homemade food and, uh, um, and uh, wine by the glass. Uh, for those who don't know, osteria is just Italian for uh, family rest. But Massimo, I believe you know that very well. Um, so Giobasta, my boss's great grandfather, installed a installed at the time a fossil on a cart and went winery to winery, winery distilling at the spot. That was the most uh, the, the more convenient the more convenient way uh, to distill at the time because they didn't have enough space to uh, install that that you see behind them at the time. Um, and they still have the, the, the distillery in our museum, still has that very same mobile toxin. It's uh, preserved in our museum and it is a unique piece. Mobile distillation uh, uh, was abolished very, very soon uh, because of uh, um, uh, taxes reasons, I would say, because the duty couldn't measure how much grappa uh, you were producing. So they needed to give you a counter. In order to give you a counter, you uh, would have to be stationary, not moving around. So, so they found <laughs> the space to install these three, uh, these uh, first three uh, fossils, uh, and those are uh, at the beginning of this row. You know, the, the, the row of fossils that you see behind me, 
the, 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 the three uh, ones the just you know uh, in a straight line behind my head those are uh, those are the ones uh, they are just properly maintained they are still the very same uh, the second generation of Grappa makers uh, uh, installed a fourth pop still uh, just to enlarge the production a little bit so did the, the third generation adding four more pots and uh, finally in 85 uh, when, when the actual generation uh, so Jakob and his siblings they took over they installed uh, four more reaching the number of 12 pots uh, and then you know like like my presentation says the three uh, initial ones are still in touch and they are the ones that I uh, indicated this is the poly family now uh, as you can see, they are finally smiling. <laughs> they are more modernly dressed, uh, but they're still the very same thing. Still uh, family based, uh, uh, with a uh, more modern conception, but completely attached to their roots. So the, the, the poly family still uses that artisanal uh, alambic to produce a, a more modern kind of rapper. Um, you can see from this screen, uh, we could do that what we make in general. We make young grappa, aged grappa, aromatic, which comes from aromatic uh, grade mark, and uh, infused. Uh, grappa is the only spirit which comes from a solid raw material, because even other ones like uh, uh, tequila or mezcal, for example, that uh, come from, from a plant, that plant, of course, then is cooked uh, and uh, um, cut in pieces, but it's normally, it's normally uh, distilled along with water. In the case of Vinaccia, it's not uh, distilled, or, uh, distilled along with water, it's just solid growth. Um, just to let you know the, the quantities needed, out of, four, out of, out of uh, uh, 100 kilos of waste, uh, you gather uh, 65 lit give, give, give or take, you know, uh, as near as makes no difference. 50, 65 liters of mass so that, you know, uh, at the end they uh, give you 100 bottles of wine and 25 kilos of great market that uh, mm, diluted end up into three bottles of grappa. I mean diluted because out of the pot still um, the alcohol volume is very, very high. So, of course, you need to lower it down. Um, Massimo, a question. Am I talking too much and too fast? Is it, is it uh, convenient for you for you to follow? You're doing great, Dario. And this is a fantastic presentation. Oh, oh you're so lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs> so nice of you. Um, this uh, is a scheme of the uh, artisanal method. So you have a, a copper pot into which you put the great mark. Um, from the bottom, water steam is inflated. This water steam goes through the great mark, just literally through, because uh, the, the, the layers that you see uh, into the pot, they have perforated bottoms, so the vapor can go. Mm. Uh, then is, is then gathered through a pipe into the distillation column. The distillation column has just uh, the unique purpose, uh, the only the sole purpose, uh, of separating uh, alcohol and water. This is possible because they have a different uh, um, uh, temperature of uh, condensing. Uh, therefore, uh, water uh, condensed at a um, higher temperature and uh, uh, alcohol uh, at, at a lower. Therefore, it's easier to separate them. At the top of the column, uh, we end up with uh, roughly, okay, we will say, 75% uh, alcohol and 25 water. Uh, after the installation column, uh, the pipe goes into a, a second container, I would say, uh, into which it makes a spiral. And this spiral is uh, refrigerated by cold water. The cold water, well, cold, I will really say, cold, I, uh, it's around uh, uh, 15 Celsius. Okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, this uh, water circulating around the spiral has uh, the purpose of condensing the vapors. The vapors then go through a bell 
I, I'm, I'm just going very quickly um, around this, uh, this procedure, but of course, stop me if I'm not clear. Um, after the condensation, the, 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 the liquid goes through a bell, and the bell um, allows the grappa maker, the grappa master, to understand when it is the right time to cut the head, which is uh, the first part of the installation, uh, and the tail, which is the last part, the last liquid that comes out of uh, the pot. Uh, keeping only the heart, so saving only the heart. Uh, if you were here uh, with me in the distillery, I, uh, I would be able to let you smell the difference between the head, the tail, and the heart. It's a very, very interesting experience. Um, I strongly encourage all of you uh, to, to come visit us because uh, feeling it with your own senses is uh, completely different. Um, on the other hand, this uh, is a theme of the industrial method. The industrial method is the one that we absolutely don't use. Uh, because uh, it provides a more uh, flat result. Uh, and uh, the, the reason uh, of this uh, flatness is quite simple. Uh, so, um, uh, you know what, I, I'm, I'm not going too much into details. Just, uh, uh, just um, make clear that uh, um, this particular kind of study, this particular kind of technology, this feels many times, many times in order to give you a high alcohol volume product. And every time you distill, you leave behind part of the taste. Uh, that's why we prefer the artisanal one, because the artisanal one is filled only once. And with that only uh, and sole distillation, you preserve as much as you can the original taste. Um, even now, even nowadays, 34, 34 industrial distilleries are able to produce 82% of the total graph of sold, bottled and sold, and 89 artisanal distilleries only produce 18%. 18%. So, so this gives you uh, a very, very clear idea. Um, this is the box with the box is just behind me. And, uh, and now, um, I, I don't know how many of you uh, have the chance to taste along with me, but uh, uh, I don't know if you have the product with you, Matteo. Maybe, maybe you have them at home, <laughs> but I don't think in your office. Um, I, I would like to, to um, give you a description of the product of uh, the products that I selected for you. Uh, this one is uh, Sarpa Oro. It is our um, it is our most renowned product, and uh, it comes from Cabernet Merlot, and then is aged four years in barrique. The the barriques are the only size of uh, um, cask, the only size of uh, you know aging vessel that we use. Uh, it's uh, it's, uh, it's a quality for, for quality. It has a very robust, uh, yeah, it has a very robust um, and smell and taste. Um, gives you a clearer, uh, a clearer nose of uh, Merlot, and then, and then at the taste, it still gives you the herbaceousness, uh, the freshness of the Cabernet Sauvignon. It is an everyday grass. Huh? because uh, you never get tired of it. You never get tired of it because it is uh, complex uh, and then at the same time mild. It has uh, the aging, the tertiary aromas of the aging, the primary aromas of the uh, raw material. It, it is a fantastic product. If I had to, to pick one grappa for myself that I would have uh, uh, for the rest of my life, I think it would be. Nice. Cheers. Going on with the presentation, I would also uh, be happy to tell you that uh, along with the uh, traditional pot still, we also have uh, a, a more innovative pot still, which is still behind it. It's just, uh, you know, on the other side. Um, it's called uh, a Chrysopea, 
and this cocktail is capable of distilling in vacuum. So what happens uh, in a very few words is that we put uh, the um, raw material inside the pot. We steal it and then we suck out all the air, creating vacuum inside. The big advantage of the vacuum is that uh, uh, there is nearly no pressure inside it. And with nearly no pressure, we also lower the boiling point. So rather than distilling at uh, 105, 110, uh, as in the uh, traditional one, in this one, in the vacuum of memory, we are able to lower the temperature down to 54, so nearly half as much. At that temperature, we preserve most uh, of the aromas so uh, especially the, the, more the, the more volatile aroma. So the second one that I picked for your, uh, for your taking today is Cleopatra Moscato. So this one comes from uh, uh, white Moscato and is distilled in the uh, vacuum, vacuum bainmary uh, hosting that I told you about. And is aged only one year. Uh, because we didn't want the wood to, to be predominant, to, to cover too much, to be overwhelming. And uh, uh, this Cleopatra is uh, an explosion of perfume. You know it very well, Martin. And it reminds you of uh, Earl Grey, oranges, uh, um, well, I would say white flowers for the most, and it is incredibly mild and, gen and gentle at the mouth and the throat. So, even a general sip of it um, doesn't make you uh, doesn't make you uh, the, the aggressive doesn't give you the aggressive feeling that you would have from a spirit that is you know forty percent alcohol. This is incredibly gentle. At the palate. Um, oh, this is uh, uh, this is uh, just a, uh, a picture of our barrack room, but it gives me the opportunity to tell you that all our grapples are aged one year in stainless steel at least. This is incredibly important for the esterification process to take part. Uh, because in the case of grappa, most of the acidification happens uh, after the distillation. So uh, in the in the year that follows the distillation, and it needs to stay in in uh, in hurt material. So that's why stainless steel. After the stainless steel maturation, we can either choose to uh, sell it uh, um, young or to age it. Uh, in the case uh, of today, I take the two age product. Mildly aged, only four years, only four years the first one and one year the second. Uh, this is the full range of products that we have uh, uh, with Wimbo. Uh, I Have you have you tasted them all, Matthew, or not yet? <laughs> I have, including the vermouth recently. Ah, yeah, yeah, good, 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 good. good. Um, speaking of, speaking of, I also picked the two vermouth for today. Fantastic. So, the first I picked in this um, in this uh, this poly branded tumbler, I don't know if you, <laughs> you can see it, <laughs> is the white vermouth. Um, I'm I'm not going to give anybody a lecture on vermouth. It's a very uh, well known uh, uh, fortified wine. It has uh, deep historical meanings. It is uh, supposedly uh, the first uh, aperitif. It was uh, probably the first aperitif for Italians. So also it has a uh, social meaning. Um, what uh, makes us different uh, uh, from the other vermouth, uh, the white one and the red, uh, is that uh, neither of both come from uh, uh, caramelized wine. Normally, vermouth comes from uh, Moscato, which is a sweet wine, then, and then it is caramelized, you know, to make it even sweeter, or if you want to make it red, with uh, um, burned caramel, so to give the color. 
Okay, in the case of our vermouth night robot comes from comes from Moscato, we want them to be uh, fresh and with their own character. So they come from uh, echo wine. Uh, in the case of the white, it comes from Vespaiolo, which is then fortified with, uh, with alcohol of our own production, obviously, and uh, it's used in house. And then, of course, uh, it is also matured uh, in bottle, because since, since it comes from, uh, from a good wine, from, from Vespaiolo, uh, it also uh, develops in bottle. It gives a very, very good result. Incredibly floral, um, sweet, uh, surrounding taste, but at the same time crisp, fresh, uh, and clean at the ending. Thanks to thanks to the wine. The red one, same concept, of course, more robust and more uh, surrounding as a taste. Uh, this one again, it is not coming from uh, white wine and then caramelized, it comes just from wine. And when you will see uh, in your own glass the color of it, you will definitely say, yeah, it's wine. It has uh, the same tone, uh, the same uh, texturing mouth, and this one comes from Merlot. Merlot grows here in Bregante, like five minutes away from here, five minutes by car. So, yeah. Again, uh, there is bitterness, uh, there is uh, um, sweetness, uh, uh, spiciness, uh, some acidity that makes it fresh and um, crisp and also clean. So it leaves you wanting more, which is uh, what we all want from a drink. We want us to, to feel like, oh my God, I would love another glass. <laughs> That's what we want. You said you're tasting them both, right, Matthew? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, last but not least uh, of my, my today's selection is the Sambuca. Um, Sambuca, um, which, is, uh, which is a liqueur, so it's neither a distillate or a, a wine-based uh, drink, it's, it's a liqueur. So, liqueurs by definition are alcohol, aromas or infusion, depending on your style, and sugar. Uh, Sambuca has very, very, very strict rules uh, regarding how it should be. It needs to be at least a uh, certain, certain quantity of sugar, it needs to be at least a uh, certain range of alcohol, and uh, it can only be uh, aromatized with one aroma, which is star any, the one that you see in the label. So the challenge to make a poly style sambuca was not easy. Was not easy because uh, with so little that you can change, uh, what can you do? So I think uh, we just made it uh, um, the most simple that we could, and at the same time the most coherent with what we are. So we just made it very, very clean and simple. Alcohol of our own production coming from uh, uh, grapes, so already milder than uh, other kind of alcohol coming from cereal. Uh, the, the, the cleanest uh, uh, white cane sugar that we could find, and uh, this made a lot of difference. And the infusion is in house So, you know, we took control of every single step, only three steps, but we wanted to make them proper. And uh, for those who have tasted it, uh, uh, I, have, I have to say, I'm very happy to say that we received a very, very good feedback. It is, uh, it is uh, undoubtedly some book. So you smell it, say, yeah, of course, some book. But then it is uh, uh, silky and uh, gentle. Uh, it doesn't give any harshness, it feels like a candy. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, despite the very high alcohol volume, it still feels uh, 
swab in, in your mouth. I actually bought it for my father. So. <laughs> okay. if that's not a guarantee. <laughs> um, I think I have covered everything I wanted to cover for today's presentation. Great. And, uh, and forgive me. Okay, sorry. Uh, I think I've said everything I wanted to say for today's presentation. And uh, uh, are we? Is, it, is the time over for today? No, no, we have time for a couple of questions if you have time. I, I'm, I'm at your disposal. One of the questions was Are there any new trends happening in the grappa industry? Any kind of uh, new ideas, or is it pretty much cemented in history? Uh, oh, tricky question. Uh, so, locally, uh, in North Italy especially, well, I would say all North Italy, um, grappa is still the drink. So, even among young guys, uh, it's absolutely common to see uh, friends gathering outside uh, in the evening after dinner and say, let's have a grappa, let's have a second one. Uh, because uh, I believe it's just uh, it's just like for uh, uh, for Americans having a bourbon. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not American, so I <laughs> I'm just guessing. But it's really it's really uh, part of uh, what we are and what we drink uh, in the evening. In the At the same time, there is this uh, uh, mixology trend, uh, which is not new at all. Uh, but uh, lately, uh, bartenders uh, are trying to uh, use. Uh, is, ne is not an easy spirit to blend, is not an easy spirit to mix, but I have seen a very, very, I've seen a tasted very, very good, uh, very good drink with grappa. And certainly you guys are involved in a lot of that cocktail culture and, and suggesting how to use grappa in a craft cocktail. We, we are involved, yes, but uh, we try to stay away from certain decisions. I always say it is up to the bartender, it is up to the mixologist for me. I can provide it, I can explain it, I can tell him why it is uh, this way, why it is good quality, but then it's up to him. We don't want to interfere with their job, they are the artists, they do it. Absolutely. Another question we had was if you could um, explain the difference uh, between what categorizes a grappa producer between an industrial producer and an artisanal one. Is it a certain amount of grappa produced? Is it how big the facility is? Uh, mostly it is uh, the technique used. Uh, technique used is very, very important because uh, uh, we discussed it during the presentation. Um, if you use a uh, traditional pot still, technically you distill only one. Oh, if you use it properly, you distill, you distill only one. So um, you try saving all the aromas as much as you can. If you use uh, uh, an industrial one, just for the, for the way it is built, for the concept behind it, it needs to distill at least Times at least try it. So, inevitably, every time you distill, you lose part of the original taste. Sure. So, that's the first, I would say that's the main difference between the two. Got it. Got it. Uh, so, we are coming to the point, Dario, where we're going to take a break and grab a sandwich. Of course. Uh, I know it's gonna be better than the ones we would have had at Verona Fiere, um, but I wanna say thank you so much for- no, Not a difficult challenge, I mean, it's not really an achievement, I would say. I'm gonna have a sandwich to the one in Verona Fiere. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> thank you so much for spending your time with us, sharing your passion. Uh, I am one of those people who has never been to Bassano del Grappa. Uh, I'm gonna fix that really soon. What did you say, Mastro? <laughs> Mastro, look, uh, thank you very much for uh, spending this time with me. Thank you for, for meeting me. Uh, I hope I will have you very soon here. And um, 
well, uh, soon enough, I will be in the US again, and uh, hopefully we will meet again. So, uh, all the best uh, of luck and fortune for all of you through these difficult times that I'm sure they will end. I'm sure. I, I'm, I'm optimistic. No so question. Say, Andrà tutto say, bene. Andrà tutto bene. <laughs> Thanks for spending time with us, Dario. Grazie, Massimo. Big hug. Grazie a te. Un abbraccio. Yeah, okay. See you soon, buddy.